we have seen so far how our body needs nutrients for energetic, structural, and regulatory functions, and how these nutrients are contained in the food we eat. To be able to use these nutrients, the first task that our body has to accomplish is extracting them from the food we eat. This is the goal of digestion. Once food has been broken down into its individual nutrients, these must go inside our body so they can enter the bloodstream and be delivered to the tissues and organs that need them. This process is called absorption. From your point of view, the food you eat enters your body the moment you put it in your mouth. But anatomically, your digestive tract is still an external part. Nutrients really enter your body the moment they cross the membrane of your intestine during the process of absorption. Digestion and absorption occur in different steps in our gastrointestinal or GI tract, which at its very essence is a tube about 7 meters long that connects our mouth to our anus. This long tube is made of four major anatomically distinct parts, the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, and the large intestine or colon. Our GI tract has many other functions on top of digesting and absorbing food. For example, it prevents pathogens or other potentially dangerous substances from entering our bloodstream. It houses a huge population of bacteria that are necessary for our survival, and it plays very important roles in immunity and hormone production. As far as digestion is concerned, this is both a mechanical and a chemical process. The mechanical part is accomplished by chewing, softening food with saliva, and by muscle all along the GI tract that keeps mixing the GI content, as well as moving it along. The chemical part is accomplished by specific enzymes, which break down nutrients into units that are small enough to be absorbed, as well as other digestive juices, which create the optimal conditions for these enzymes to work, and different hormones that orchestrate the whole process. For those of you who are not familiar with the basics of biochemistry, just think of the digestive enzymes as little scissors that cut nutrients into smaller pieces. Let's now have a look at the different parts of our GI and briefly discuss what they accomplish. In our mouth, food gets chewed and mixed with saliva so that it's broken down into smaller pieces moistened and softened, all of which makes it easier for digestive enzymes to do their work. Our saliva also contains some enzymes that start breaking down starch and some lipids, and it contains lysozyme, a natural disinfectant. Once swallowed, our food travels all the way down to our stomach through the esophagus, pushed by muscle contractions. In the stomach, the food is exposed to an extremely acidic environment because its cells secrete hydrochloric acid. This extreme acidity has multiple functions. It kills most of the potentially harmful bacteria coming from food. It activates some digestive enzymes. It enhances absorption of some minerals. It helps breaking down connective tissues in meat, and it promotes protein denaturation. We will learn what this means and why it is important when we study the proteins. The stomach also makes an enzyme that starts digesting proteins. The stomach content is then pushed little by little into the small intestine, which connects the stomach to the large intestine. The name small refers to its diameter, which is narrower compared to that of the large intestine, but definitely not to its length. The small intestine is a long tube that takes up 6 of the 7 meter of our GI tract. We can divide the small intestine into three distinct sections based on the different tasks that they accomplish, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. The small intestine is where most of food digestion and absorption take place. Its inner walls are made of thousands of small projections called villi, which dramatically increase the surface area of its lining, and it is where the vast majority of digestive nutrients are absorbed. Indeed, these villi are made of specific intestinal cells called enterocytes that are specialized for absorption. On one side, they face the small intestine where they take the nutrients from. On the other side, they face our blood vessels and lymphatic vessels to which they deliver the nutrients they absorb. On the side facing the intestine, the membrane of these cells is folded into small projections called microvilli 
that further increase the absorptive surface and make the intestinal walls look like a brush. Indeed, we also refer to these absorptive structures with the name brush border. Three accessory organs help digestion in the small intestine. These are our pancreas, our liver and our gallbladder. The pancreas secretes a digestive juice that contains bicarbonate and a lot of very powerful digestive enzymes. Bicarbonate buffers the acidity of the food arriving from the stomach and creates the ideal conditions for the pancreatic enzymes to work. Our liver produces a solution, the bile, that is stored in our gallbladder and is released when food enters the intestine. The bile contains important chemicals that make lipid digestion possible. Some more digestive enzymes that complete nutrient breakdown before absorption are located on the brush border. The part of food that is indigestible or that was not absorbed in the small intestine, as well as most of the water and digestive juices, moves along and enters the large intestine or colon. Most of the water will be reabsorbed here. The colon houses billions of bacteria that are also referred to as the gut microbiota and play very important roles not only in food digestion, but in many other aspects related to our overall health. The selection of a favorable gut microbiota can promote our general health, enhance immunity, prevent colon cancer, and in general, reduce the risk of developing a variety of disease. As far as digestion is concerned, these bacteria ferment some of the stuff that was absorbed in our small intestine, such as sugars, fats or proteins, as well as undigestible substances such as fiber. The products of their fermentations, which include some important vitamins and some small useful lipids, can be subsequently absorbed and used by our body. Another important function of the colon is reabsorbing most of the water. Not just the water we drink and that is contained in food, but also the many liters of water from digestive juices and secretions of the GI tract. The residues of fiber dead intestinal cells, dead gut bacteria, unabsorbed water and nutrients, as well as waste and toxic compounds, accumulate in the final part of the colon and form the stool which will be expelled. So this was a very simple overview of what happens to food after it goes into our mouth. On this we have probably skipped most of the details on which nutrition textbooks focus at this point. We haven't named enzymes or hormones and we haven't really described how nutrients are digested. But we will make up for it. When we study the individual nutrients, we will examine more in detail how each of them is digested, absorbed and transported inside our body.